Hello, welcome to Bridging Worlds, Rust Build Scripts to Mix Existing Build Processes. I'm Gustavo Noronha. I'm with Collabra since 2009. Uh, currently working a lot of mentorship and internships. I've been a free software developer from around 1999. have been a Debian developer, a GNOME contributor, infamously creator of GK Sudo or GK Su. And for a while, I was also one of the maintainers of WebKit GTK. So I've been trying Rust uh, for a while. Two years ago, I started learning, gave up uh, after fighting a lot with the borrow checker. Last year, I decided to try it again, and I've been in love with it uh, since then. So I would like to go over a quick recap of what Rust is and how it can help us. What is the problem that we're trying to solve uh, with the Rust build system? And how Rust build scripts help us fix that problem. And I'll give you an example using G-Resource and a crate, which is a library in Rust uh, speak that I built for it. So what is Rust? Why Rust? and Cargo. This is what I would like to go over with a quick Rust recap. Rust is a systems language. That means it's an actual replacement for C and C++. It's compiled. It, it provides zero-cost abstractions. It's very fast. It's very easy to interrupt with a C ABI. So you can use C libraries and ex existing infrastructure. It doesn't have runtime overhead, like languages like Go, for instance, which means it's also embedded friendly. You can even use it in uh, boards or in systems that do not have an allocator. So you can even use, for that, use it for that. Uh, however, it's not like your usual C-like language in that if you're trying to re learn Rust, just trying to pick it up, uh, as you would with a normal C-like language, will most certainly not do. So you really need to come at Rust from a fresh perspective, because it, it has several very different, very dis distinct concepts, especially in how it handles memory. And what that difference from C-like languages gives you is memory safety, essentially. So Rust has a very powerful type system that is very flexible and very expressive and allows you to tell the compiler a lot of things that allows it to give you uh, security that the code that you're writing is memory safe and that it behaves well even in uh, multi-thread situations. So to give you a bit of an idea of what I mean when I say memory safety, I would like to go over this very interesting example that I stole from a talk uh, on YouTube given by the creator of Rayan. Rayan is a library that allows you to very easily turn sequential uh, workflow, uh, workloads into parallel workloads. Um, I, I hi uh, highly recommend that you check it out. So what we're looking at in this example is a theoretical load images function. Uh, it receives a, an array of paths to images and it uses an iter, an iterator to go over each of these paths and load the images into image objects. So you can see that it returns a vector of image objects. Uh, th at the same time, it also counts how many PNG files it saw while doing that uh, loading of the images. So this is a, a fairly simple code and it will compile. Nothing uh, relevant to see here. But when we introduce something like threads, this code may, look, may be a bit more interesting. And that's what we did by replacing the iter there with par eater. Par eater is a simple feature of Rayon, this very powerful library that allows you to turn very easily uh, 
sequential workloads into parallel workloads. So what Rail will do here is using a thread pool, uh, automatically break the array into several smaller pieces and run this closure uh, in parallel. So this code does not compile because there is now a data race here. If you look at PNGs, the variable, it is now being used at the same time but by several uh, instances of disclosure. So you have several, several threads fighting for changes, for reading and writing to this variable. So you may have uh, a couple of threads, for instance, read the same value of, of PNG and when they add one to it, they will both uh, write the same number to it. So that's, that, that won't do, right? You, you're going to end up with a, with a, a miscalculation at the end. So how, how does Rust deal with this? So here's how Rust saves the day. This code simply does not compile. It knows that this uh, closure will be executed in parallel uh, by several threads, so it knows that one of them must own PNGs and it will, it, will, it will tell you that you cannot touch this variable in another closure. So while the error message here could be better, uh, it's l not letting you commit a, uh, an error that C, C++, Go, Python, any of the other languages that are out there would probably let you uh, commit, right? So you would have a data race and not even know about it. So now we know how, how Rust did not allow us to build that code. How can we let it build the code? How, how can we make it let us build the code again? One way to do that would be to use the atomic types that Rust provides. So it does provide a lot of atomic types, especially for the uh, number types. So here we are using atomic use size, and you can see that there's a, a pretty complicated <laughs> method that you can call on it to add one to the value, right? So this will make sure that uh, atomicity is uh, ensured. You can choose the ordering uh, in which that uh, happens. And this code will now compile again. Another way to fix this problem is to use something that is more likely to be found in other languages, like a mutex. So I think that it's an interesting uh, example to give as well, because it shows how mutexes are very different in terms of how they work in Rust compared to other languages. Usually in, your, in other languages, you have a mutex where you lock uh, a specific part of the code, right? So you have a, a specific block of code that is locked by that mutex. And that is kind of true as well for Rust, but Rust also knows about the data that it is protecting. And you can see that it, it returns a variable that's called a guard. So the type that it returns when you lock it is not the data itself, it's a guard. So it, it works more or less like C++ uh, RAII concept, in which the guard, while the guard leave, li uh, lives, you can still use the data, right? It's still locked. You can drop the guard or when it goes out of scope, it will be automatically dropped. So there's no forgetting to unlock a mutex, for instance. So that's very good. Now let's talk a little bit about Cargo. Cargo is the Rust build system. It's not the Rust compiler, but it's its build system. And it's also kind of a state-of-the-art package manager. So you can use it to install Rust tools like bat, which is a cat replacement, uh, into your system. Uh, Cargo is, as we will see in, this, in the next slides, uh, very uh, focused on Rust code itself. So what is the problem with Cargo? Cargo was made to build Rust binaries, essentially, or libraries, and that's it, right? It, it's, it doesn't really provide all the support for things uh, like data files, creating translations, etc., that other build systems 
provide, such as Amazon or CMake, that kind of, of thing. So you really don't have a lot of configuration of, of, of ways of configuring a cargo project to build other anything other than the application, the code itself, right? The, the binary itself. But you need that in modern applications. If you take a, a GTK uh, GUI application, for instance, it will, have, it will have XML files that describe the UI. It will have uh, translations that need to be uh, included in the installation. And those uh, translations are actually uh, messages that are uh, sucked out of the code base, including out of these XML files, put into uh, files that are then used by translators to translate, and then those files are compiled during a, uh, uh, the build of the application and need to be installed and loaded by that application. So there's a lot, of, a lot involved here that Cargo does not help us with at the moment. And that's why, for instance, if you see a GTK application, uh, how, how it's supposed to be built with Rust these days, it's still by using Meson, which integrates with Cargo uh, underneath. Now, I just said that Rust does not give you a lot of control in terms of configuration, but <laughs> contradicting myself here, Rust does give you a lot of flexibility in how the build works because you can use something called a build script. And that build script is uh, literally a build.rs uh, source file that you put into the root of your code base. And it gets built and uh, is executed during the uh, uh, building of the code base to help you do anything special that you need to do. So for instance, uh, whenever people are using something like uh, proto buffers, uh, they will use build.rs to take the definitions and generate the code with it. This is an example of a build script that I am playing with. Uh, it provides me a way of giving the build uh, a prefix so that the application knows at runtime where it's supposed to be installed so that it can look for, for instance, insta uh, translation files by using a variable, an environment variable, during the build process. So I set duplicate prefix as an env environment variable, and I add this build script to my code base. It will read the environment variable, and it will generate a Rust source file that includes a static global variable that uh, the rest of the code can use. If you look at the, the end of this example, there's a print line there, which has a, a very specific format. And what's, what, that format, what that string is saying is, you need to rebuild if this environment variable changes. So there, there's a lot of control that you can have here to specify if this file changes, I need you to rebuild. If this environment variable changes, I need you to rebuild. So let's uh, stop talking about Rust itself for a second and talk about something called gResource. gResource is a very neat functionality provided by GNOME's GIO library. And what it does is it gives applications a very simple and powerful interface to load data files from various sources. So that can be out of the file system or, and I think that this is the most interesting way of using gResource, is it gives you a, a way of embedding data files into your binary so that it becomes a lot more portable and a lot less rel reliant on where it's installed and all the paths, etc. And the way it does that is you write a, a, an XML description of the files that you want to embed. And during the compilation, during the building of your application, it will run this glib compile resources binary to generate a C file. And that C file is going to be built and linked into your application. A C file, you say. So how well does that, how do we do that in Rust, right? 
So thankfully there is a crate, an existing crate called CC, which can be used in build scripts to essentially do exactly that. So you take a C file and you build it into your Rust application. Like I said before, Rust does uh, inter interface very neatly with uh, uh, C ABIs. So if there, if there is a C ABI, you can even build C++ files into your Rust application. And we won't go into too much detail here, but what's usually done is you then wrap those C APIs, C ABI calls into unsafe blocks providing safe uh, interfaces in Rust for the rest of the Rust code to use, right? You don't want the, all of your Rust code to be calling unsafe C ABI uh, functions. Okay, so the CC crate would already, already be a very big help for us here, but you still need to do all of, of the other work, right? You need to read the XML file, you need to figure out what are the source files it refers to, so that you can let Cargo know you need to rebuild when these files changes change. Um, you need to build to call glib build resource compile resources to generate that C file, and then you use the CC crate to build that C file into your code base. So what I did was I put all of that work I just said into a nice crate for us to use called gbuild. And you just need to tell it where to find the source code, what's the XML file, and it will do all the work for you. So here's an example of the Rust code that I used then in the application to load that file that got compiled into the binary. As you can see, I don't need to provide anything. I don't even need to call any C functions here because GIO's uh, C code that got generated is so nice that will, it will register constructor, process constructors that will automatically register all of the data into the GIO in infrastructure. So all I need to do is really uh, call a load from resource and several uh, GTK and GIO objects provide that functionality, uh, like GIO's file and in this case here, GTK's uh, CSS provider. So I'm loading the CSS file that I used to style my widgets uh, from the binary itself using GResource. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about uh, in terms of build scripts and Rust and G-Resource and GTK, but I'll leave you here. I hope you have some questions for us to discuss. I'll be available, of course, to answer them if I haven't already during the, the, the talk. Uh, just a final message. We are always hiring. If uh, some of this looks interesting to you, if you're looking into kernel, graphics, uh, multimedia work, GStreamer related, etc., give us a, a call and thank you.